Uh, in this next segment, you'll meet John Elliott. Uh, he's a, a, a lovely Brit uh, journalist and writer who, whom we saw with a beautiful British walking stick walking up the tiger to the tiger's nest in Bhutan, which is a picture that you saw from Ira Block earlier. And as well, Justin Milano, who started a company called Good Startups. We met randomly at this event. Uh, we went to dinner and we uh, invited him here to be with us. So I encourage you to find Justin and understand about his startup, Good Startups. With this, we transition from a general discussion of prosperity in the world stage to a specific country, India, uh, not just a specific country, but a country, think about this for a second, the size of the entire human population for most of human history. 1.23 billion people, something around there. We're not sure exactly how many people. And we have two people well qualified to share uh, the near future of that country with us. First, of course, Sam Petroda. Many of you will remember from Kin a few years ago, Sam joined us. Sam is credited by most having been fundamental to the transition and the uh, rise of the technology economy in India, not just from a policy perspective, but also from an entrepreneurship perspective. He is Mr. Tech India. Uh, as an entrepreneur, as a political advisor to the former prime minister, and remains quite active. Uh, after Sam presents his perspectives, we'll be joined on stage by John Elliott, the British author with the walking stick I mentioned earlier. He's been in India for about 30 years. He was a correspondent for The Economist, for Fortune, for the Financial Times, and is today happily writing books about the present and future of this great country. With that, I welcome Sam Petroda to the stage. <laughs> Sam, thanks so much for Hi. making the trip back. I know your flight was delayed. Just hardly uh, made many it. Many of us are. Thank, Thank you so you. much. You want me to start here? OK. First of all, thanks for inviting India is a very complex country of 1.3 billion, long history of ups and downs, struggles. Just to put things in perspective, India was the biggest economy in the world in 1760, not too long ago. Then Indian economy was 27% of the world economy. Then comes British Raj. Indian economy goes from 27% to 2%. Almost over 200 years of colonization had huge impact on India. In 1947, when India got independence, India had very little modern infrastructure. Human resource, institutions, universities, R&D labs. So rightfully so, founding fathers decided to focus on building institutions. <coughs> Scientific laboratories, Atomic Energy Commission, space research, defense research, so-called IITs, IIMs, it took almost 50 years to build the kind of human capacity that India would need. In the process, India built strong democracy. Today, India is faced with three fundamental challenges from my perspective. One, disparity. Disparity between rich and poor, urban, rural, educated, uneducated. Two, demography. India has 600 million people below age of 25. What do we do with these young people? How do we educate them, clothe them, provide them skills, jobs, prosperity is the biggest challenge in front of India. In India, we need to create 10 to 12 million jobs, new jobs, every year, year after year. 
Third, development. Everywhere you look around, you need expansion, excellence, and equity. We need more colleges, more universities, more hospitals, more roads, more power plants, everything we need in large quantities. The quality is poor because it takes time to build quality into the system. I have a chance to work in India from 1980, when India had 2 million telephones for 750 million people. I went in there to focus on digital communication. Today, India has 1 billion phones. India is a country of connected billion. I spent about a decade working for Rajiv Gandhi. Then I had a heart attack, quadruple bypass. I ran out of money, decided to come back to US. And then once again went back to work on knowledge, innovations, and digital India. Today, based on my own experiences, I can tell you that India is indeed positioned to grow at the rate of 8 to 10 percent for probably the next 30 years. There'll be peaks and valleys, there'll be ups and downs. But overall, there is human talent, basic institutional framework, but still, governance is a big challenge. So from the viewpoint of governance, I believe we need massive administrative reforms. Today, all our processes come from British Raj. Indians have complicated it, and now we are computerizing it. So we need process re-engineering on how to start a company, how to close a company, uh, how to get admission in schools, how to get medical records, all of that. We need judiciary reforms. We have 132 million or 32 million court cases pending today. It takes 10 to 12 years to get justice. So if we get administrative reforms, judiciary reforms, fair amount of political reforms, I believe we have all the tools built. For example, in the last five years, we have been able to issue unique ID with facial, iris, fingerprints to one billion people. No one ever has done something of this magnitude. We have now programmed to provide all GIS maps for the country. We are computerizing courts, prisons. So I believe digital technology would help a great deal ultimately in administrative reforms and judiciary reforms. Today, not only we have billion cell phones, we also produce $140 billion worth of export every year, year after year, in software and services. It has taken a long time to get to where we are. I wish we could have been further along, but everything takes time in India. It is hard to understand India from Western perspective. If you just measure India based on GDP, GNP, per capita income, productivity, efficiency, it don't make sense. Indian systems do not work on productivity and efficiency. Indian systems work on perk, privilege, and patronage. It takes long time to change a society with 15 different languages, 30 different states, you go from north to south, it's a very different world. You go from east to west, it's a totally different world. You go to east part of India, people look like Chinese. And you don't even realize that you are in India. It is not just one country. It is more than a continent. To move that elephant takes a lot of energy. 
It's easy to criticize. It's easy to see what's wrong with India. Because identifying problems don't need a lot of talent. <laughs> the real challenge is to get things done against all the odds. I tell my friends in India that we have 19th century mindset, 20th century processes, and 21st century needs. How do we get all of this together? Is a huge challenge in India. India has been around for thousands of years, and I guarantee to you, India will be around for several thousand years. India may not move at the pace the world wants India to move, but I think next 25 years are going to be very critical in the history of India. I am very high on India mainly because of technology, IT, biotech, nanotech, materials, alternate energy, and a lot more, and young talent. Lot of young talent in India. Every kid is on WhatsApp. Everybody knows how to use mobile phones. Nobody reads instructions. I don't know how they do it. It is that generation that's going to change India. My generation probably messed it up. I'm very hopeful that with technology and young talent, India will rise, but India needs time. It's not going to happen in the next decade. It will happen in the next two, three decades. It's an interesting journey. I just finished writing a book that I got for our host here. It is about my journey to connect India in the last 30 years. What did it take to connect India? It took about two and a half decades. <laughs> Nothing happens in a country of 1.3 billion in a decade. With this, I once again want to thank organizers for this opportunity. I assume this is enough of an introduction, and maybe we'll have longer conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah. for you. I, and I will be reading this on the trip, uh, the Kin Expedition to Cuba next week. Good. So <laughs> thank you. And if we could welcome John Elliott out to join us. John, over to the hot seat. So uh, I've asked John, being the, uh, the fifth estate here with us today, the, the journalist, the writer, so the rock on tour. We met. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we met. We had a little conversation. I left Great. your book back there, I'm afraid. I didn't bring it with me. It's not uh, well, we have a copy here, so I'll just, I'll just continue to go like this throughout the segment. <laughs> um, I thought two would be too much. Yeah. So uh, uh, John, I, I asked you to, to listen to Sam's introductory remarks and, and offer you the opportunity to, uh, to jump in quickly. And then we'll return for some of your thoughts about where India is headed. Yes, I, I was interested because I, I listened to your um, speech here um, on, on, on YouTube three years ago, um, and I thought... I don't remember what I said then. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I can. You, you were more optimistic. You were more bullish. You were because we were in power. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, who's we? <laughs> Congress party. <laughs> Congress party was in power. Um, you, were more, you were more bullish. Um, you didn't have the which I think is very correct. I mean, I would, I, on that one, I would have said you were far too bullish and you were relying too much on technology. This time, you did stress the long-term problems. You did stress, and it'll take more than 10 years. Of course, you're hoping that the current government will be out of power within 10 years. That's why you say it needs 20 or 30 in order for another government to come in. Um, but um, it's that stress. But going back to the detailed points, yeah. um, it, was where, it was where you started on the, on, on the three points of disparity, demog demography and development. I mean, it's that demography, which is, everybody in India talks about the demographic, demographic dividend, that there's this huge welter of youth who are going to lead the country on to great things, and there's now worry that it's going to become a demographic disaster, because not enough is being done um, to build skills and to build the education and to build the jobs that will enable this huge dividend. I mean, dividends are no use if, they don't have, if they're not used, um, and, and there's a potential social problem, not only a waste of youth, but also the problem of... Um, of, of the social unrest that could stump, come from that. So I thought you were right, very, very right to, to focus on that. And this huge disparity, 
um, which in a way grows as, um, as economic development eats into the countryside, because it opens up the possibilities of, of what people didn't know about before. Yeah. I mean, India's going through this ho huge churn so in the changing, last 20 years. changing expectations of people yes. as they're exposed In the last 20 or 30 years, I mean, the, the co coincidence of the opening up of the economy from 1991, which was really the start, although Rajiv Gandhi did quite a lot on it in the 80s. Um, and that coincided with the, with the communications and the television and then internet and social media um, bursting on, onto the Indian stage so that people now have access to information and they know what they could be getting. So if they don't get it, then they get more frustrated. Um, and also they see, literally you can see it in every city as development spreads out from the city into rural areas and people in those villages see the potential of what they, could, what they didn't know they could have had 10 years ago. So there's huge social pressures, and that, for that, you need better education, better skills training, and these were the points that, that, that Sam started off with. Great. But I Sam, think we really, we really need to think differently today. You know, the education doesn't mean going to school anymore, according to me. Education doesn't mean four years of college to get a degree. Certainly it means two years to get an MBA, right? No, no, definitely not, no. not at right. the cost. No. Okay, no. Definitely okay. not at the cost. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can tell you, I have a son who went to Harvard. I have a daughter who went to London Business School. Too damn expensive. Yeah. Those schools are too expensive. Uh -huh. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I said. Okay. <laughs> so I think we need to think differently in terms of skill development. We need to use new tools, new techniques. We cannot deliver based on the old model. Yeah. I'll give you one simple example. We need to train lots of welders for construction industry. We can't train enough welders because there aren't enough welding machines for each welder to be tied to a welding machine. So Ramadurai, a friend of mine from TCS, and I sort of looked at this and decided to train welder on laptop. You'll be surprised to learn that now we can train welder on laptop without ever even looking at a welding machine. Okay? Because now I can take that on cell phone and train somebody how to weld on cell phone. All the skills. Now this is a new paradigm. But how much is that happening in India now? Beginning now. It Beginning. Just, software just got developed. It's already in the works. But alongside that, you need, to have an, you need to build an acceptance that skills training is an okay thing to do. It's, 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 It'll all happen. It's it, happens, it happens when you start something. It's not a society which recognizes what in, in, in Britain we call trades, building right, trades right. and engineering trades. It's right. not a society which recognizes those as being the right thing to do wherever you, wherever you are in the in in in, in society yep. there needs to be a new attitude where skill training to become a carpenter or to become a um, a, a welder or a, a whatever um, is recognized as being a worthwhile job which has cachet in the society at whatever level in the village or in the town it depends on which society which part of the society you're talking about i'm a son of a carpenter okay my family but you didn't train as a carpenter but that's okay, that's the option I had. Okay, that's a good option I had. Okay, but there are lots of cousins of mine who are still carpenters. It's okay. There are blacksmiths, but the tradition was there, there are plumbers, yeah. there are, you know, all kinds of people. So it's not the formalized Western way of looking at training. The training comes from family and family tradition. But family tradition is breaking down. No, but, you know, people get trained in a family tradition. So my family, for example, of carpenters, never had a certificate. Never had? Never had a certificate. Never had formal training. They all had jobs. They all build their lives. They all earned enough money. So it depends on how you look at it. Okay. But the Western mind says, you have to have a certificate for carpentry. Fine. I don't think that's true. Well, this is an interesting point, and okay. you brought up the cost of education, which is essential. I'm, 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 I'm proud to mention Northwestern's announcement earlier this year that no undergraduate will leave Northwestern with any loans 
as a result of the university's new approach to financial aid, yeah, which is it's very expensive. It's been a long time coming, but it's very exciting. But, uh, but the whole, the whole um, model of what it means to educate must change, not just in India, but certainly yeah, in India, it. scale is, so, is paramount. And so the ability to do these things at scale is something that is a pressure that India feels probably more than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, with respect to this younger generation that, that's rising up, and you, you mentioned the dividend or the disaster, which one will it be? What, what are some factors that, that we can, that we can, what are things people can do to ensure it is a dividend as opposed to a disaster? Are you, oh, you good. Okay, I can try. First of all, you will have to really create an environment where people don't look for jobs. People create jobs. This whole idea of government delivering everything, job, certificate, exam, textbook, is just not feasible anymore. So you'll have to create jobs by local people, in local communities, and not in Delhi. So earlier version was that government is going to decide how many jobs will be created, how many in this, how many in that. That model is not scalable, nor it is workable. So you'll have to create local jobs in local communities. You'll have to encourage people to be more entrepreneurs, and people have been entrepreneurs in India for generations. You know, It may not be entrepreneur in terms of Silicon Valley, but they've been entrepreneurs because of little shop, it is tea shop, grocery shop, distribution system, all that, okay? So I think this whole idea that you have to have a degree, you have to have a job, is just not workable. Yeah, of course, it's absolutely yeah. true that a huge amount of the, of the um, in Indian economy is in the informal eco economy. Absolutely. Um, the the, the organised sector is, 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 is very small. But despite, however way you look at it, whichever way you look at it, the, the number of, un, of underemployed youth is growing. Yeah. The stories one hears, the stories one sees as one travels around of youth not having jobs to go to, however they're structured. And I, and I think it's wrong to deflect the problem by saying that the job should be created and the family should do it and all of that. And I don't mean this at all personally against you, but it's very easy in India to find excuses for not, not I'm not suggesting you are, to find excuses for not doing things. Um, everything will be all right, let's just leave it. Um, Jagad is fix it and Chafahe right, is right. it'll be all right on the night. There's right. a huge sense. And if you put up things like, oh, it'll all be done by technology or it'll all be done by that, then things never get done. Um, what I, I think that on the rural jobs, um, what needs to happen, which has been talked about for years and has never properly been developed, is food processing and making use of the produce um, that, that's grown. So a mm -hmm. huge proportion of it is not wasted on its way to market. Um, there's not proper cold chains, there aren't food processing factories. There's a huge spread there of opportunity. And then you need to make sure that the colleges are actually efficient, and, the and I'm sticking to the formal education. The colleges really do perform. An awful lot of colleges in India are virtually illicit. They're not training properly, they, don't, they produce phony degrees, and even those that do produce degrees um, are, not worth, are not worth having. I had a guy who was my office assistant with some years ago. Notable, had, uh, a number hmm? of notable exceptions, of course, hmm? John. With a number of notable of exceptions, oh, of course. Oh, huge exceptions, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. But, but the notable exceptions are tiny compared with the size yes. of the problem. Yeah. I mean, it's always tempting in India. I had an editor once on the Financial Times when I was the industrial correspondent years ago, and I told him Britain was going into a recession at the end of the 70s, and he would always go and find a couple of small companies every week to prove to me that really things were improving and, and there were new entrepreneurs coming into the business, and we had a huge recession. It's very easy on India to do the same sort of thing. Um, and uh, an awful lot of the colleges just don't produce, uh, produce what's needed. I had an office assistant um, some years ago who had the equivalent of an Oxbridge um, PPE, philosophy, pol politics, and economics, from some obscure university in UP. He might well just as well not have gone. He actually was brilliant at translating English into Hindi into English, but he didn't have many other capabilities. And that problem, this was 20 years ago, now this problem is huge. 
There are things that need to be grappled with, and part of that is governments getting to grip with the regulations, the state governments getting to grip with the regulations of the colleges, and also developing what can be done for employment right. in the rural sector. So unfortunately, we're coming uh, down to the end of what is a brief segment, and at, as many of you know at Kin Global, the idea is for you to find uh, Sam and John later on and engage with them personally while they're here. Uh, but uh, sort of a concluding question, We've talked a bit about what are the issues and how might we start to think about overcoming them, but what are some leading indicators? What are some indicators we should be watching over the next few years as to how India is trending, how we're doing against some of the challenges that you've posed? Sam? I have a very different view of the world in many ways than a lot of my Western friends. Okay. Let me tell you how I see it. Okay. Don't judge me based on your standards. Okay, that's what I tell my colleagues. What you think is right and wrong versus what I think is right and wrong are two different things. So if you come back and say GDP, GNP, per capita income, balance of payment, foreign trade, you know, how many degrees, how many graduates, that may be your scale. It may not be my scale. I remember having a dialogue in the 60s in America where people said, India is a basket case. There is no way India can feed 600 million people. It is impossible. Okay? You are a disaster. Okay? Today, India can feed 1.3 billion people, and India has surplus food. They must have done something right. Okay, Of course, agricultural colleges have a problem. Of course, graduates are not worth as good as you would have it at some other places. All of that is given. The beauty of India is, whatever I say, you can say exactly opposite, and you are 100% right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember so you comment. got to look at India in that light. Yeah. You see, I, having spent 52 years in US and working in India for 30 years, I have come to a conclusion that the world needs to be redesigned. World was last designed after World War II by US. World Bank, NATO, IMF, you know, whatever, UN, GDP, GNP, per capita income. That design, 70 years down the road, is obsolete. Doesn't work. You need a new design. That design said democracy, human rights, free market economy, consumption, war. We need a new design, which moves away from this paradigm. 70 years is a long time for a design. Sam, what's one, con what's one concept that would underscore this new design you're talking Inclusion. about? Inclusion. Inclusion. Similar to the conversation that Sian and Greg had. I didn't hear the conversation. Ah, that's right. I Your flight was delayed. Okay. Uh, world needs to be more inclusive. Okay? Don't judge world based on one set of standards. World is very different. We are all different. You, know, you can't take my standard and put it in Africa and say, oh, according to my standard, this is right and this is wrong. Right. Okay? Right. So I think we need to think of inclusive world. I mean, even in the US, we are not inclusive. I live in Chicago for 52 years. South side of Chicago hasn't changed at all. Okay, you go to University of Chicago, it's great. Four blocks down the road, same for the last 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, U.S. has two million people in prison. Why? I think inclusion is the key. So we can talk about that separately. Great. <laughs> John. I think if you're waiting for inclusion, you'll wait for a long time in, in India. I don't see it happening for a long time. Um, inclusion will come uh, with economic growth. Uh, economic prosperity changes people's attitudes, changes the envy, changes some of the, the, the uglier sides of the society, might eventually change the, the caste system. Which, um, so you need economic growth. And even though you might sweep aside the figures, you ask for indicators for people to watch. You need economic growth of around 9 or 10%. People are very suspicious of the current 7% figure, say it's 2% too high, higher than it should be. And they've, they've fiddled the way that the inflation is, is built, into, in, built into the figuring. 
but watch the economic growth, see if India is doing better than the rest of the world, because it's a big enough economy to do so. And secondly, I'm afraid I'm going to go off economics, and, I'm gonna, and it's a negative. And I know this is not a conference aimed at negatives. Watch what, and, and um, Sam can't say this, I can. Um, watch no, what, no, no, hang, no, 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 watch I what happens, you've done what I'm about to say. Watch what happens with Hindu nationalism. Watch how the uglier, right. whether the uglier side of this government develops. Ro uh, Narendra Modi was Very voted good. in not by people who wanted Hindu nationalism and a repressive, intolerant society, but by the youth who we've been talking about, who wanted an India that would get moving, yep. which, with great respect to Sam's friends, the Nehru Gandhi dynasty and the Congress party did not do for 50 years, and therefore India's finished up with a nationalist government, which people hope will get something done. The question is whether Narendra Modi wants to build a strong nation to be nationally proud of, or whether he and other people want to build a repressive, Hindu nationalist um, nation. If you see that side of the, of the Indian news building up, and of course it's an easy thing for, for us all to write in the press, and it does probably sometimes get more published than it should, but if you see that trend coming, then worry about India. Because if this government focuses more on, on nationalism and repression and lack of freedom of speech and managing the universities so that they only believe in the Hindu nationalist creed, and this is not the religion, it's the nationalism I'm talking about, then you've got problems. And I know there was one person in this audience who I was talking to um, over lunch, um, and he would like the indicator to be whether the Gandhis pack their bags and leave. <laughs> Great. Well, clearly, India is a topic we will not cover in 40 minutes. Uh, we've we've done no, uh, 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 only across the top of this question. It's interesting to note the extraordinary contrasts uh, between India, its history, its present and, and likely future, uh, but also the similarities to some of the challenges that we're facing in the United States right now, and certainly in Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, John, the demographic, demographic dividend or disaster, uh, and the essential question for any country that is blessed uh, with so many young people in a situation where other countries are facing a demographic cliff, uh, uh, becoming old, will we become rich before we become old? Uh, certainly the models that we had before are not going to sustain in the future. And one of the exciting things about India to me is that the challenges are so different in many ways and at such a scale that people can try, they have the pressure to try things, and I dare say we're going to learn a lot from the sort of scaling that you talked about, Sam, the technologies to train, the technologies to lift up the, the younger generations to help them learn and adapt and create jobs, not just seek jobs. The potential is incredible. It's I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to sound negative. Astonishing. The potential is... Well, this is an interesting... John, this is an interesting point because there is a lot of, I guess you could say, negativity or, or foreboding, but you both agree that growth is coming, and Sam, you mentioned 9 or 10 percent a year with some bumps here and there over the next 30 years. What does 9 or 10 percent look like over the next 30 years? That's but, but simply a, astonishing. I mean, it's a country of amazing him, brains, a great, a, work. a great, great brains, I mean, amazing brains, an amazing technical ability. Yeah. And my worry, having been there for 20 or 30 years, is that that could go waste. Yeah, That's yes. why I'm sometimes negative. Yeah. It's good to have that view. Because yeah. then only you are really on your feet. Only the paranoid survive, Absolutely. Andy Groves. <laughs> a, a, a quick anecdote, then we will go to break. Thank you for your attentiveness. Many, uh, most people in Hitler's government in Germany did not believe that the United States would be much of a quantity were the United States to enter the war. The rationale for that they gave was quite clear. There is no way the United States can train enough qualified engineers in manufacturing to raise the war effort quickly enough because we had disinvested over a couple decades. The technology that the Nazis didn't know about or didn't appreciate was called the textbook. Believe it or not, the textbook and the standardization of engineering capabilities allowed the American war machine to rise within a nine-month period in ways that no one had anticipated. Perhaps we'll see that happen yet again. Thank you very much, John and Sam. Thank you.